Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. On Pride Day, June 24, 1973, a New Orleans gay bar called the Upstairs Lounge became engulfed in flames within a matter of two or three minutes. It was the work of an arsonist. 29 people died in the fire, and three later succumbed to their injuries in the hospital. It is the deadliest fire in the history of New Orleans. But in the immediate aftermath, survivors found no support from city officials, the Louisiana governor, or even churches. There were no condolences offered, and in fact, many churches refused to bury the dead. But the gay community rallied around the survivors in what is often considered the beginning of the gay rights movement in New Orleans. Though there was an official investigation by police and the fire marshal, no one was ever arrested, and the case was closed by 1980. And despite the enormous tragedy, the fire was all but forgotten to history for decades. But in recent years, historians have fought to bring light and understanding to this event that has caused so much pain for the LGBTQ community in New Orleans. Welcome to Episode 55, The Upstairs Lounge Fire. Situated on a bend of the Mississippi River, New Orleans, Louisiana has been the Gulf of Mexico's busiest port since the early 1700s. It was nicknamed the Crescent City because the original town of Vucure was built on a sharp bend in the river, forming the shape of a crescent moon. New Orleans is world-renowned for its Creole cuisine, unique dialect, and for being the birthplace of jazz music. While America was fighting the Civil War, New Orleans was the only place in America where slaves were allowed to own drums. When European horns were introduced in the late 19th century, the voodoo rhythms mixed with horns soon became a staple of New Orleans bar rooms. The jubilant style of jazz made people feel alive and free. New Orleans is forever influenced by its European heritage. Louisiana was volleyed back and forth between the French and Spanish from the late 17th century until the United States bought it in 1803. The term Creole was originally used by French settlers to distinguish those born in Louisiana from those that immigrated. The Creole language is considered a hybrid of English, French, and Spanish, and there are estimated to be more than a hundred different Creole dialects, starting from the 1500s. But many consider the dominant language of Creole to be French, as France founded Louisiana. New Orleans has embraced the vibrant history of Creole culture in every sense. There is nothing like a New Orleans accent, though many try to compare it to other regional dialects. And there is truly nothing like Creole cuisine. Influenced by European settlers, but rooted in the seafood unique to the area, New Orleans Creole cuisine draws in foodie travelers from all over the world. I can almost taste the jambalaya and crawfish etouffee as I say this. New Orleans' other nickname is the Big Easy, for its round-the-clock nightlife, with the sounds of jazz spilling out into the streets, from bars and revelers free to roam the French Quarter. Today, Bourbon Street is the biggest tourist attraction in New Orleans, where beads are dropped down from balconies to the crowds partying below. Natives and tourists alike show out for celebrations and festivals, most notably Mardi Gras, but also Southern Decadence, a gay pride festival. The last hundred years of New Orleans history have been marred by social strife with racial tensions, poverty, and natural disasters. Hurricane Katrina, a deadly Category 5 hurricane that made landfall in August 2005, caused catastrophic damage, killing almost 2,000 people and displacing more than a million people in the Gulf Coast region. New Orleans in the early 1970s was a product of everything else that was going on in our country. It was the beginning of the Watergate scandal and the end of the Vietnam War. Many social advancements were made with the women's liberation and black power movements. The landmark decision of Roe v. Wade gave women federally protected agency over their bodies for the first time. And the early 70s were heavily influenced by the culture of the late 60s. Hippies were galvanized by Timothy Leary's mantra of tune in, turn on, and drop out. And they did, in waves. 
Drug culture became darker and more prevalent in the 1970s. In June of 1969, the Stonewall Riots in New York kicked off the gay rights movement. The riots were a series of spontaneous and violent demonstrations from the gay, lesbian, and transgendered people in response to a police raid at the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village. The LGBTQ community had suffered years of discrimination, abuse, police brutality, and ostracism. And they were finally fighting back. Today, Gay Pride Month is June, and Pride Day is June 24th. But marches and celebrations go on for weeks all over the country, starting in 1970 and continuing today. What began as a crucial movement for the gay community to regain their dignity, fight for equal rights, and to just be seen in America is now a celebration of diversity and love. I'm going to pause here for a quick commercial break. I want to begin the story of the Upstairs Lounge Fire by pointing out that this episode would not be possible without the work of two authors, Clayton Delery Edwards and Johnny Townsend. Johnny Townsend's book, Let the Faggots Burn, was written first. It is really from the survivor's perspective, with poignant looks at those that did not make it out of the fire and those that did. Townsend had the trust of the gay community and sought to humanize victims and survivors, as well as explain gay culture of the time. Clayton Delery Edwards' book, The Upstairs Lounge Arson, is a more historical accounting of the fire, the investigation and the aftermath of how the tragedy affected the gay rights movement. And he gives The Upstairs Lounge Fire its rightful place in history, as well as an intimate perspective on the gay culture in New Orleans. There are a few other books and documentaries, but I found the works of Townsend and Delery Edwards to be invaluable in researching the tragedy. I would also like to mention that while I won't use the F word except in relation to Townsend's book, I will be using the word lover quite a bit. In the early 70s, that was how partners generally referred to each other, rather than boyfriend, girlfriend, or partner. Obviously, they could not get married, so they didn't refer to each other as husband or wife either. So you will hear me use the word lover because that is the vernacular of the time, and to interject modern language felt clunky. I warn you because I know some people are not fond of the outdated word, but I feel it is essential to this story. And in the end, this story is about love, and I think the word is appropriate. As I said before, New Orleans of the early 70s was just as heavily influenced as other major cities by what was happening nationally. But New Orleans also had a reputation of tolerance, though that reputation was not always deserved. There were more than 20 gay bars in the French Quarter at the time. But sodomy laws were still on the books, and the community was still subject to police raids. But it was still the French Quarter, not all of New Orleans, that was more tolerant to the gay community. Also known as the Vue Carre, meaning the Old Square, the quarter was established by French and Spanish colonists with an unusual amount of free people of color. Perhaps that is how the spirit of tolerance in the quarter began, where people of every color worked and lived in the same area. It was a matter of time before the gay community would flock to a safe place like this. But while tolerant, there were still stringent laws designed to discriminate against gay people. Johnny Townsend pointed out that there were 13 arrests and four beatings in the month of January alone in 1971. As usual, the transgendered and more effeminate men were most often targeted. Gay men sought out each other in private places, often called tea rooms, which were usually really just bathrooms. The main cruising spot for the French Quarter was Cabrini Park, and male hustlers worked many gay bars in the quarter. And while a lot of those bars catered to hustlers and their johns, when 39-year-old Phil Esteve decided to open a gay bar in 1970, he was determined that it would be a respectable establishment. Phil met his future bartender and manager, Buddy Rasmussen, at a gay bar on Iberville called The Tavern. Phil hired him on the spot. Buddy was an out and open gay man. He had done a stint in the army, and when he was caught with another man, he decided to confess to his commanding officer and was discharged. When he went back home to Texas, he decided he would never hide his sexuality again. It cost him many jobs because he always told potential employers up front. He didn't work for six months when he moved to New Orleans, though he soon found great success behind a bar 
serving drinks to other gay men. Phil and Buddy set to work renovating the space Phil had chosen. It was on the second floor of an old three-story building on the corner of Charters and Iberville in the quarter. It wasn't exactly a desirable spot for a bar, with walk-in business being hard to attract on the second floor. Phil and Buddy put up a canopy at the entrance to the stairwell, which read, upstairs, on two sides, beckoning patrons to follow the stairs. Immediately, the men found the entrance to the stairwell to be unacceptable. It was uncarpeted, and its 13 steps twisted through ugly piping. So they carpeted the stairs and hung fabric, draping the walls to hide the pipes, making a much more inviting entrance. Inside were three rooms. The first one some 20 feet wide and 44 feet long, with four windows overlooking Iberville Street and three overlooking charters. The huge archway led into a second room that was 16 feet wide and had three windows overlooking Charter Street. The third room was dark because its three windows were painted black, and it had a fire-rated door that led out onto the rooftop of the next-door building, of the building next door. All of the windows were nine foot tall with sashes designed to be raised to catch breezes in the stifling summers. But by 1970, the building was air-conditioned, and the previous tenant had put bars over the windows as a safety precaution. If opened, one could literally step out and fall, so it's understandable. Another problem is there was no balcony. Balconies are abundant in the quarter. Nearly every bar, lounge, or hotel has them on higher floors. Designed as a place to go out and feel the breeze, balconies were also critical to fire safety. If upstairs had been equipped with a balcony, experts believe the loss of life would have been way lower. Buddy and Phil felt like the windows hurt the intimate feel they wanted to project. They wanted a private space, so they walled over two windows behind the bar in the first room and all of the windows in the second room. The color scheme of the bar was kind of already decided with the pink and orange laminate that covered the bar. There was red flocked wallpaper and red indoor-outdoor carpeting throughout. There was no escaping the colors, so they leaned into them, draping fabric over any blemishes. Beefcake posters of the time adorned the walls, like the iconic one of a naked Burt Reynolds on a bearskin rug. Buddy even bought himself a white jumpsuit, all the rage at the time, and tie-dyed it pink and orange. They built a small stage in the corner of the first room and put a white baby grand piano on it. In the middle room, they elevated a platform that would be used as a dance floor. Incidentally, the upstairs was the first gay bar in New Orleans to get a license that allowed dancing. Public touching between the same sex was not allowed, so naturally, dancing usually wasn't either. It's important to note that while Phil and Buddy were doing everything they could to decorate and make this bar charming, they were careful to follow all fire codes. The entrance door was replaced with a fire-rated door, and two other fire exits were created. One that I already mentioned in the third room, but another was created in a window near the main entrance. It was not barred, and it opened onto a fire escape. But the fire escape lacked a ladder to get to the ground. Instead, there were stairs that took you up to the third floor. Phil didn't just comply with fire codes. He gave open invitations to the vice squad. He was determined that his bar would not be for hustlers, and even discouraged drag queens originally. One narcotics officer, after checking the place out, liked it so much that he became a regular and brought his wife Betty. And anyone having sex in the bathrooms would be thrown out. Phil knew that he couldn't completely police that, but he did the best he could. The upstairs lounge opened for business on Halloween of 1970, and the first annual costume party took place. Though the bar had a few loyal regulars, business was still slow due to the location. Buddy had the idea to hold a weekly beer bust. They would charge a cover of $1.50, and then it was all you could drink from 5 to 7 p.m. every Sunday. At the end of the bust, you brought your mug back and redeemed it for 50 cents. So essentially, you could drink all you wanted for just a dollar. They hoped that people would stay after the bust and pay regular prices. And it worked. The beer bust really took off, drawing in a hundred or more patrons every Sunday. Phil hired a man named David Gary, affectionately known as Piano Dave, to play for the crowd during beer busts. It always turned into sing-alongs, and Dave ended the beer bust every week with a rousing chorus of United We Stand. Patrons stood in a circle, proudly singing the song first made famous by the Brotherhood of Man and then Sonny and Cher. 
it was a weekly ritual cherished by regulars. The upstairs also hosted Mardi Gras parties, Easter bonnet contests, and hilarious tricycle races. Buddy was not only a consummate professional, but a genial and enthusiastic bartender. He called everyone honey or sweetheart, and did his best to make everyone feel at home. After the success of the beer bus and other parties, Buddy and Phil built a stage along the rear wall of the third room. Betty, the cop's wife, and several other regulars were instrumental in getting a small theater group going, putting on small plays called Nelly dramas, where cross-dressing and cleverly disguised raunchiness really brought out the laughs. Soon they were putting popcorn on all the tables in that room, and patrons would throw it at the villain when he appeared on stage. Though Phil had originally discouraged drag shows, the popularity was growing, and he couldn't ignore the value in hosting these shows. The upstairs first drag performer was Marcy Marcel, birth name Marco Sperandio. She would come on stage at 8 p.m., an hour after the beer bust or theater performances. One regular at the bar was Reverend Bill Larson from the Metropolitan Community Church. The MCC was founded in 1968 in L.A. by Reverend Troy Perry to minister to the gay community. It had branches in Atlanta, New York, and Nashville, and the New Orleans branch opened in 1970, coinciding with the opening of the Upstairs Lounge. The church was originally located in a tiny house on Elysian Fields Avenue, but when Reverend Larson took over from the previous pastor, he knew he had to find a bigger place. He went to Phyllis Steve and asked if he could hold Sunday services before opening time, before the beer bus started. Phil agreed, and the first MCC Sunday service was held on May 19, 1971. Congregants got used to staying after services to enjoy the beer bust. And though they eventually raised the money for their own property a few months later, the tradition of going for afternoon beers at the upstairs carried on. Perhaps with the MCC's influence at the bar, the theater production started becoming benefits, with donations going to disabled children and the needy. The upstairs lounge had become what Phil had dreamed, a haven for the gay community, a place where friends, black and white, could meet, gay men could bring dates, and even straight people felt comfortable. The affection of the regulars and the all-around exuberance of the bar was remarkable. The loving atmosphere of the upstairs made the coming tragedy that much more heartbreaking. I'm going to pause now for a word from one of our sponsors. On the morning of June 24, 1973, Pride Day, Marcy Marcel woke with a feeling of dread. She wasn't the only one who would later tell of premonitions. Townsend documents many stories of people having a bad feeling the day before and the day of the fire. A feeling that danger was coming, or that they were saying goodbye to a friend they would never see again. It was a blazing hot day in the quarter and there was no thunderstorm in the afternoon to cool things down. Usually, you could count on an afternoon thunderstorm. It was said you could set your watch by them, but not that day. Marcy decided to stay in the air conditioning and never left her apartment that day. Normally, she would get ready and go down early to catch the end of the beer bust, but something made her wait. Even when it was down to the last minute, she decided to wait and watch the first few minutes of a Betty Davis movie that was coming on at 8 p.m. She was due on stage at that time, but thought it would be okay if she was late just this one time. Buddy and his lover Adam got to the bar by noon that day. Buddy had to balance the till from the night before, make a deposit, and open the bar for the beer bust. Adam, who affected a British accent to hide the Creole accent he was so ashamed of, was a severe alcoholic. It was a problem, but Buddy loved him and took care of him. He handed him his first drink at 2 p.m. Adam always sat at the end of the bar watching Buddy and was also beloved by other regulars. Phil Esteve was not in the bar that day. He had taken off so that he and his lover could go see Damn Yankees at the Beverly Dinner Playhouse. Though it was Pride Day, it wasn't really celebrated yet in New Orleans or at the upstairs. 
but it was the regular Sunday afternoon crowd of many MCC congregants and other regulars who always showed up for the beer bust. The bus started promptly at 5 p.m., and Buddy later estimated some 90 people were there that afternoon. When the bust ended, the crowd thinned out to about 60 core regulars. At 7 p.m. when the bust ended, Piano Dave stepped down and the next player, Bud Matty, got up to finish the evening, though Dave stayed around to hang out and sing with his friends. The bust had not gone smoothly that day. There was a young, dark-haired man who had stationed himself in the bathroom. Without Phil's knowledge, a hole had been drilled between bathroom stalls. He was harassing patrons with lewd comments through the hole. A regular named Michael Scarborough reported him to Buddy and his other bartender, Hugh Cooley, sometime between 6.30 and 7 p.m. They made him get out of the bathroom and told him to leave everyone alone. Angered at this, he went to Michael's table to confront him. Michael finally stood up and punched him in the jaw, knocking him to the floor. Seeing the fight, Buddy and Hugh threw the dark-haired man out of the bar. Another disturbance was caused by a young man with long, dark blonde hair. He would grab empty mugs and nag other patrons with pitchers for a refill. He was warned several times about this, and when the beer bust ended, he went around grabbing mugs, aiming to claim the 50-cent deposits. Buddy caught him and told him to leave. As he walked out, he grabbed two mugs and smashed them at the bottom of the stairwell. Hugh went down to clean up the broken glass, and Buddy was cleaning his station about to leave and let Hugh take over for the night. He had been there since noon, and his shift ended at 8 p.m. He and Adam had dinner plans with another couple, Reggie and Regina. Reggie and Regina have one of the most touching love stories of all that I read in both books. Both came from very religious backgrounds, and when they found each other, it was definitely a love match. Regina's real name was Ricky Saletto, but she lived as a woman and asked Reggie what name she should choose for herself. He told her his name, Reginald, meant king, and that she should be Regina, as she was his queen. Regina was white, and Reggie was black, and she would later say that there weren't many safe interracial places the couple could go. She said, quote, We felt at home upstairs. The couple was sitting up close to the piano with their friend, a white straight woman named Jean Gosnell, Piano Dave, another straight woman named Inez Brown, who was there with her two gay sons, and a couple of other regulars. When Reggie realized the time, he remarked that he didn't have enough cash on him for dinner and needed to go back to the apartment for the checkbook. But Regina told him, no, you just ordered a drink. Their apartment was a five-minute walk away. She kissed Reggie and said, I'll be back in 10 minutes. She would never see him again. At 7.53 p.m., a woman who lived across the street from the bar was walking to the corner Walgreens on Iberville and Royal when she heard a woman shout fire. She turned around and saw the flames in the stairwell of the upstairs and ran into the midship, the bar next door, and told the bartender to call for help. The fire department recorded the call and dispatch at 7.56 p.m. The upstairs lounge had a buzzer for daytime deliveries and for taxi drivers to ring when picking up patrons. Right around 7.52 or 3, it started buzzing nonstop. No one knows to this day why or who might have done it. But Buddy, irritated, asked a nearby patron if he would go check the door and make the person stop. Luther Boggs was a favorite regular and always happy to pitch in. He walked over to the door and opened it, and flames immediately pushed him backwards, catching him on fire. Though the door had been fire rated, installed especially to comply with fire codes, the spring mechanism failed and the door blew open. The stairwell drew oxygen from upstairs, creating a chimney effect, pushing the flames into the bar within seconds. The carpeting, the drapes, wallpaper, decorations, everything was in flames so fast, many people sat frozen, stunned. A patron who had been near the entrance hit the floor as soon as the fire burst through. He made his way to the side window with no bars, picked up a chair, and broke the glass. He jumped down to the fire escape and then panicked when he found no ladder to the ground. There was already a crowd of onlookers, and they screamed for him to jump. And he did. On fire. A patron from Midship Bar poured a pitcher of ice water on him to put out the flames. Luther Boggs and Jean Gosnell were right on his heels. But Jean was scared and going slowly, 
so Luther pushed her, accidentally breaking two of her teeth. Once they were on the fire escape, they were both on fire and tried to slap the flames out on each other. He got the flames on Jean out, but he was still on fire when he jumped to the ground, where the man also poured water over him. There are horrific photos of Luther Boggs on a stretcher, the skin dripping off of his body. He is clearly screaming and writhing in pain. Jean was too scared to jump, so she climbed the stairs to the third floor to wait for rescue. She would survive and be in the hospital, undergoing countless surgeries, amputations, and skin grafts. Luther, her best friend, would die in the hospital. Inside the bar was pandemonium. One couple, watching the struggle for exits, decided to run directly into the flaming stairwell together. Astonishingly, both men survived, though with severe burns. By then, most patrons couldn't get to the fire escape exit that Luther and the others had gone through because it was too close to the stairwell. Buddy, of course, knew about the third entrance and acted quickly. He started tapping customers on the shoulder and shouting, Come with me! Come with me! But many people were too scared and confused, including his lover Adam, who remained frozen on the bar stool. Buddy wound up leading a group of about 20 people to safety that night. A man named Dwayne Mitchell, known as Mitch, had been in that group. But when he got out and looked around, he realized his lover Horace was still inside. He ran back into the inferno to rescue him. Their bodies were later found charred together. Once Buddy had gotten the people out and onto the roof next door, they began climbing into one of the apartment windows and made their way down to the street. They looked up at the fire and, horrified, watched their friends suffer in the flames. Four people had made it down the fire escape. About 20 got out with Buddy. That left around 35 to 40 people to try to find their way out. They were yanking drapes down, pulling shutters off of windows, but the safety bars were in the way. Some people managed to slide through the bars. One of these was Rusty Quentin, who worked as a bar back. There is an iconic photograph of him sitting on the ground, crying and looking up at the fire. The caption on the photograph reads what Buddy was crying. My friends are up there. He was with the crowd taking care of the wounded and encouraging people to jump. A young man named Francis Dufresne made it through the bars and later told Clayton Delery Edwards, quote, Back then, if you were thin, you were in, and I was thin, thank God. He woke up in a hospital two weeks later with third-degree burns over much of his body, including his face. Michael Scarborough, the guy who had punched the young man harassing people, also made it through the bars though his face, arms, and hands were severely burned. Reverend Bill Larson of the MCC had also been at the bar that day. He pushed out an air conditioner, trying to make it out of a window, but was caught up in the bars. He was heard screaming, Oh God, no! as his friends below watched him burn to death in agony. You can see his body in pictures, hanging halfway out of the window. It is a gruesome and pitiful sight. Three other people burned alive in the window next to him though only one man's shoe is visible in photos. Survivors on the ground watched as the trapped people desperately pressed themselves against the windows. Buddy could see Adam clearly, still on his bar stool, screaming and waving his arms. He was finally knocked down by the stream from a fire hose. Regina had taken only the ten minutes she said she would. By the time she walked back, the upstairs was engulfed. She cried and tried to run up, but a firefighter stopped her. But my lover is waiting for me, she screamed. Finally, someone told her that none of the people who had been around the piano had made it out. Regina says she doesn't remember anything after that, and even the next two weeks were a traumatizing blank in her memory. The fire was fully extinguished at 8.12 p.m. It was just 16 minutes after the call for help was recorded, and 29 people were dead. Police had arrived to control the crowds and begin their investigation. Buddy stayed to administer help where he could and comfort his friends. He spotted the dark-haired young man he had thrown out and grabbed his arm, taking him to a police officer. But the officer wouldn't listen and made him let him go. Print and TV journalists were already on the scene, and it was the Times Picayune photographer, Ronnie LaBeouf, who took the most horrific images of the night. His colleague, journalist Clancy DeBose, was dispatched by the Picayune to Charity Hospital 
where the injured were being transported. He described the hellish screams of pain and the smell of charred flesh the next day in his front page article. A new burn unit was set to open in two weeks, but when the director of charity was alerted to the fire, he ordered it opened immediately. Fifteen people were taken to charity, some released with only minor injuries, but many stayed weeks and months to recover from much more serious injuries. I'm going to pause now to hear a final word from our sponsors. The firemen on scene were sickened by the sights and smells and had to take numerous breaks. They were later criticized for leaving bodies like Bill Larson's in plain sight, but they had to. Removing the bodies was an arduous task, and many were charged to the floor and to each other, and they were very difficult to move. And the investigators had to photograph everything before anyone could be moved. Three bodies were found near or in the restroom. Several were found around the piano and scattered throughout the bar. Seventeen people were found piled together up against the windows. These were the people seen dying in agony through the windows by the crowd below. During the removal of the bodies, investigators found a seven-ounce can of lighter fluid at the bottom of the stairs. A survivor called Reverend Troy Perry in Los Angeles to tell him what had happened. Arson was immediately suspected because churches in L.A. and Nashville had been burned to the ground. People left flowers at the site only for them to be stolen. An older black man called Smokey appointed himself guardian. He was an ex-con and straight, but the people of the upstairs had always treated him graciously, and he told reporters that he couldn't afford his own flowers, but he could protect the ones others left. Troy Perry and his team planned a press conference for the following day, June 25th. They criticized police and city officials for their statements, or lack thereof, and announced a memorial for that night at 8 p.m. Perry and his team were trying to find a church for the memorial and kept getting turned down. I watched him in the documentary Upstairs Inferno saying churches were nasty to him. They hung up on him, laughed at him. Finally, Father Bill Richardson from St. George's Episcopal Church made his church available for the June 25th memorial. He faced heavy scrutiny, not only from his bishop, but from his congregants. One woman declared she wouldn't return to St. George's until they performed an exorcism. The Episcopal Archbishop of Louisiana called Richardson to express his outrage and disgust. Richardson reportedly said, Do you think Jesus would have kept these people out of church? Richardson was outraged and wrote an open letter to the congregation about the criticism. If any considerable number of St. George members feel that our church is to minister only to the select few and not the whole community, then I shall seriously consider resigning as your rector in the near future so the bishop and the vestry can look for someone else. He did not have to resign. The letter was very effective. Catholic Archbishop Philip Hannon cowered away from making a statement telling his secretary to continually say he was out of office while still releasing statements on other matters. He did not go to charity hospital. He did not attend the memorials or any of the funerals. Sadly, Catholic victims were not given full Catholic services. An unnamed priest performed a few ceremonies, but still refused to say the full Catholic rites. Johnny Townsend named his book, Let the Faggots Burn, after what was apparently overheard at the scene. One fireman said, we can't get up there, as the fire was still blazing, to rescue people. Reportedly, another fireman responded, oh, fuck it, it's only faggots, let them burn. There is no way to prove this happened. Townsend does not name the survivor who overheard it. But with the attitudes of the time, it wouldn't be surprising. Vu Carre Commissioner Wayne Collier fought back against criticism, blaming the fire marshal's office. But in fact, the fire marshals were conducting the most extensive investigation. They were on the scene within five minutes. There were two other major fires in recent years that had gotten an outpouring of public support. Official days of mourning were declared, especially for a fire that had taken police lives at a Howard Johnson's hotel. New Orleans officials, churches, and the governor had all spoken publicly about these earlier tragedies. Bishop Hannon 
conducted and attended funerals for the victims, especially policemen involved. It would not be the same for the upstairs. Governor Edwin Edwards' only public statement said he would only call for changes in the fire code. He made no condolences or showed any sympathy to the victims and survivors of the upstairs fire. Mayor Moon Landro was worse. He made a statement saying that victims were hard to identify because, quote, some thieves hung out there and you know this was a queer bar and that it was not uncommon for homosexuals to carry false identification. This was patently untrue. Most bartenders and cops agreed that the only people with fake IDs were underage kids. And amid the outright defiant attitudes of officials who ignored the tragedy were the horrific jokes, like, what major tragedy happened in New Orleans on June 24th? That only 30 faggots died, not more. And, did you hear the one about the flaming queens? One of the very worst were what some people said about the churches who were refusing to give Christian burials. That cruel joke was, quote, They're fruits. Bury them in fruit jars. But there were many New Orleanians who did step up. Townsend mentions Jim Roberts, the mortician who had embalmed and prepared Jane Mansfield's body in June of 1967. He worked at Boltman Funeral Home, which donated time and services for many unclaimed bodies and donated coffins and burial plots. The first memorial had been very small, with around 35 people attending. The Reverend Troy Perry declared a day of mourning to be July 1st and started planning a much bigger memorial. Again, they could not find a church willing to hold the service. Finally, the MCC found a Methodist church willing to hold the memorial. It was led by a black pastor and a black section of town. Pastor Edward Kennedy had reached out to the MCC and offered his church. The MCC had 3,000 flyers printed to hand out for the memorial. People on the street often wouldn't accept the flyer, afraid that even showing interest would out them. But the MCC and gay community were touched when several small businesses in the quarter, not just gay-owned, put the flyers in their windows. The Methodist Bishop of Louisiana, Finnis Crutchfield, attended the memorial, not just to show support of Black Minister Edward Kennedy, who allowed the memorial, but because he cared. In later years, he would come out as gay. It's easy to judge that now as his motivation, but he took an enormous risk at the time when he wasn't out. The state's item and the Times-Picayune estimated between two and 300 people attended the memorial, but no one was sure. Reverend Troy Perry led the service, though several other pastors spoke or led hymnals. Towards the end, Perry said, quote, We are grateful for men like Reverend Kennedy and Bishop Crutchfield who have the guts to support us today. And then he passed around printed lyrics of United We Stand, the unofficial anthem of the upstairs lounge, and led the group in singing. Towards the end, someone passed Perry a note letting him know that despite his earlier assurances, that the media would not be there. Camera crews were stationed outside the entrance. He stood and warned the mourners, many who were not openly out as gay and had so much to lose if they were seen. Suddenly, according to legend, an unknown woman stood up on the balcony and cried, No, I'm not ashamed of who I am or who my friends are. I came in the front door and I'm going out that way. Perry had been directing the mourners to a discreet side door that would let them out in the alley. Again, according to legend, every person in that church walked right out the front door. Though witnesses in Johnny Townsend's book say some did duck out the side door. I think this really happened. Too many witnesses were there who could contradict Perry. But I also think some people, rightfully scared, left by the side door. Who could blame them? They were so traumatized, so beat down, and now they were in fear of being outed to their family and employers on television. After the memorials, the investigation started in earnest by the NOPD, the fire marshal, and the coroner. Each had different roles. The NOPD were ostensibly investigating a crime, though their investigation was lacking and ultimately abandoned. The fire marshal was more interested in solving the crime, along with learning how and why it could have been prevented, along with learning why it started and how it could have been prevented. The coroner simply wanted to identify the bodies. 
The fire marshal concluded that none of the fire exits were deficient. In fact, they found that the fire door Buddy led more than 20 people through had definitely saved lives and served its purpose. Unfortunately, the fire superintendent had been quoted as saying he didn't think victims had burned to death, that they had died from carbon monoxide from the smoke. But witnesses had literally watched Bill Larson and the others burn to death in agony. His statement was a slap in the face to the survivors who watched this horror unfold. Their friends and lovers burning to death before their very eyes. Most bodies were so badly burned by the fire that identification took weeks. Three were never identified. Though the MCC tried to claim these bodies to bury, city ordinances stated that they could only be released to family and refused to release them to the church. These unknown men were buried in a pauper's plot and unmarked graves. Most victims had to be identified by jewelry. In one case, a tattoo that incredibly remained under the outer layer of skin. Regina's lover was identified by jewelry. As they could not get married, she had given Reggie her high school ring, and he never took it off. She said he was buried with it. One of the victims had actually been a dentist. Perry Waters was not actually out of the closet in his field, but he was in the community and often treated gays without insurance or money. His secretary gave his dental records when he didn't show up for work the next day, and then she released numerous records to assist in identifying the many dead. Though many funerals were conducted by the MCC, many more were hopeless, as the victims' families would not release them, and yet would not claim them. Reverend Bill Larson's own mother was so ashamed she refused to collect his body, though she did finally release it to the MCC, and they had his remains cremated. He was kept in an urn in their place of worship until a congregate donated a mortuary tomb, though his name does not appear on the outside. Witness descriptions from Buddy and others in the bar pointed to the dark-haired man in the bathroom or the blonde man trying to steal mugs. Both were thrown out right before the fire. People were grasping to find a motive, but most people thought it was the dark-haired man. Buddy gave an extensive statement about all of his day and gave descriptions of both men. Though that policeman had made him let the dark-haired man go, he had been found and brought in for questioning at about 4 a.m. that morning. The clerk at the corner Walgreens was questioned, and she remembered selling a can of lighter fluid to a young man with dark hair who she perceived as gay due to his mannerisms. She said he seemed upset, had obviously been drinking, and his hands shook. He actually asked for the smallest four-ounce can, but they were out, so she had to sell him the seven-ounce can. Police and fire investigators had both spoken to a young man named Alan Guidry, who had been at the scene of the fire and said he knew the dark-haired man who was thrown out of the bar that night. His name was Roger Nunez. When police went to question him, he seemed as if he was drunk, but then said he had just had an epileptic seizure, so the cops took him to Charity Hospital to get checked out. The doctors found he had a broken jaw, and the police knew they were looking for a man with an injury like that since Michael Scarborough had said that he had punched him in the jaw. Doctors operated to repair the jaw, wiring his teeth to hold it in place. The police left Nunez at the hospital without a guard and simply told them to contact the detectives before they released him. On July 7th, the investigators went to talk to Nunez in the hospital and found he had been discharged despite the note in his file. They spent the next two days trying to find him. Gene Davis, owner of the Hideaway Bar, Nunez's boss, had claimed that he sat on the fender of his car that night just watching the street, and yet he didn't see anyone. If he was where he said he was, he would have seen the perpetrator, and he would have seen people running from the fire. Davis then said once the fire started, he saw Nunez come from the corner of Royal and Canal Streets, and when he got to the Hideaway Bar, he said, Thank God I made it out of the fire, as if he was trying to say he was in the upstairs when it started but no witnesses had seen him come back in after he was thrown out. On July 15th, the New Orleans Fire Department chief finally spoke publicly, saying it was arson. When Michael Scarborough was interviewed at the hospital on July 17th, he provided another detail about Nunez. After he had punched him, Nunez reportedly said, I'm going to burn you all out. The detectives asked Scarborough to look at a photo lineup, and he picked Nunez out of eight mugshots. 
Scarborough's testimony and identification of Roger Nunez should have been the major break in the case. But detectives did not investigate further or keep trying to find Nunez. They filed a report on August 30th, essentially closing the case. The NOPD has been criticized since day one and on through the decades for their handling of the case. And Delery Edwards points out that sadly, this criticism is deserved. He found the language in the records to be awkward and at times even offensive as they questioned witnesses about their sex lives rather than the case at hand. One NOPD detective on the 40th anniversary of the fire told Time Magazine, quote, There are a lot of times you'll know. You as an investigator will know what happened and you know who did it, but legally, you don't have any teeth to sink in to arrest someone. You'll just have to wait. I'm sure in my heart of hearts, this is the guy who set our fire. Obviously, fingerprints on the lighter fluid can or an eyewitness to see him running away from the building would have been better evidence. But they still had enough to find Roger Nunez and bring him in for questioning. And knowing what we do know about Roger later, there is a good chance he would have eventually confessed or slipped up. The fire marshal investigators were much more diligent. They questioned the same witnesses and more. Their language in reports was not awkward, and they quoted their witnesses in the slang that was used, unlike the police who sanitized their report. When they questioned Roger Nunez, he claimed that he got his broken jaw from three black men on Iberville, who stole his wallet and knocked him down the night before the fire. He admitted going to the upstairs the night of the fire, but denied causing trouble or being thrown out. They also found a note in Nunez's hospital file that indicated that the hospital administration did call the NOPD to let them know that Nunez was being discharged, but no one showed up. And it was the fire investigators who spoke to Scarborough first and told the police to go take his statement at the hospital. They were ahead of the police in every step and showed much more interest in pursuing leads. Roger Nunez was 26 years old at the time of the fire. His parents were divorced, and he was from a small rural town in Vermilion Parish in southwestern Louisiana. It was a very poor area, with people making their living fishing for shrimp or oysters, or working on oil rigs. It was also a very Catholic region. A young gay man, effeminate, would have been uncomfortable there and unsuitable for the labor force. He moved to New Orleans in 1970. He worked for a while as a nurse's aide and also did janitorial work. He cleaned for Gene Davis's bar at the time of the fire. He had a record of minor offenses, and his friends said that in the early 70s, Nunez worked as a hustler. The hideaway wasn't strictly a gay bar, but it was welcoming to hustlers, who Gene Davis, the owner, often slept with. In the early afternoon of the fire, Nunez was seen coming into the hideaway with a much older man, and they sat there drinking until another young man joined them. This was Alan Guidry. Alan Guidry was the first person to point the police to Nunez. Guidry was also a hustler, and on the night of the fire, he managed to pull Nunez's older John away from him. They left for a while, and Gene Davis said that Roger Nunez was visibly upset by this and drinking heavily. Guidry and the older man returned around 5 p.m. and sat back down with Roger. But it was obvious he was angry. The older man gave Roger a $20 bill trying to smooth things over. Gene Davis said that Roger proposed that the three men go to upstairs for the beer bust. Davis claims he then spoke up and told the older man not to go because he was too drunk to go up the stairs, and he had already picked him up from when he fell off a bar stool. Roger left for the beer bust, and Alan Guidry and the old man left alone again. About an hour and a half later, Alan came back and went to the upstairs, leaving around 7.20. He denied seeing Roger get punched, but later admitted that he did see him being kicked out by Buddy and Hugh. Bar owner Gene Davis was a cagey witness. He had a record for child pornography and also having sex with a teenager, which obviously we would now call rape, though it wasn't charged that way then. But the point is, he wasn't an upstanding citizen, and he had experience lying to the police. He probably knew much more than he was letting on about Roger Nunez and the fire. Davis was given a stress evaluation that was used as an alternate to a polygraph. The technician said he was lying on a couple of important questions about Roger and the fire. Of course, that test is not admissible in court either, 
but it is worth noting. Buddy identified Roger Nunez as the man in the fight, the one he had thrown out, and the one he tried to take to a policeman after the fire. Roger Nunez took the same test as Jean, and stress indicated that he was lying when he said no to the question, Did you start the fire at the upstairs lounge? He was actually advised by his attorney to stop the test about halfway through. It's safe to say that it looked bad. Again, this was not admissible in court, but it is a useful interrogation tool. But without any physical evidence or a witness, they did not have enough evidence to arrest Nunez. But the arson investigator stayed with the Nunez theory and kept interviewing his friends and associates. Roger Nunez met a woman named Elaine in early 1974 and married her that May. She was 49 and he was 27. It was seen as a marriage of convenience as his seizures were getting worse. He had surgery that same year to remove a brain tumor. Right after they got married, he told her he was gay, but they decided to stay together apart. He lived in a trailer in her backyard. Elaine walked out there on the morning of November 15, 1974, and found Roger Nunez dead. He had swallowed the contents of three prescription bottles along with a six-pack of beer. He left no note, but based on how much medication was found in his system, along with the beers, his death was ruled a suicide. One of Roger's friends named Ralph was very upset when he found out and decided to go for a drink at the post office, Phyllis Steve's new bar. Phil saw this man crying and asked what was wrong. When Ralph explained, Michael Scarborough, who was sitting at the bar, burst out laughing, making everyone uncomfortable. And then he said, That is the one that set the fire to the upstairs lounge, you know? Now Phil started questioning Ralph. And he admitted that Roger Nunez had confessed to him while he was drunk. He had set the fire. Phil immediately called the arson investigators, and Ralph was brought in for a statement. He said that Roger Nunez had told him three or four times that he had set the fire at upstairs because he was mad at being thrown out. He even told him that he bought the lighter fluid from the Walgreens on the corner. Ralph reiterated that Roger was always drunk when he told this story and that he would take it back the next day when he sobered up. Roger Nunez also befriended a nun, Sister Mary Stephen, and while she didn't say he confessed, he did tell her he was a suspect. She thought he was trying to make himself sound more masculine because, quote, he had reached the point where he couldn't accept himself for what he was. The arson investigators kept talking to friends and family of Roger Nunez after his death. And in July of 1975, they presented their case to the New Orleans DA. They had hoped it would be enough for the DA to officially close the case. Sadly, that didn't happen. And there still was no closure for the gay community. The investigators fought to keep pursuing the case and talked to another witness who claimed Sister Mary Stevens said she knew a gay man who had confessed and then committed suicide. Also, in 1974, another witness came forward. A drag queen named Miss Fury had met Roger Nunez, and she told Johnny Townsend that Roger had confessed to her while he was drunk. It was on Christmas Eve after the fire, and she said he wept and told her, quote, He'd only meant to cause a little fire and some smoke. He'd only meant to scare everybody. He didn't realize the whole place would go up in flames. It would seem that Roger Nunez's conscience was killing him. When he was drunk, he repeatedly confessed to friends, and then he finally killed himself in despair. Troy Perry said on the documentary Upstairs Inferno that, quote, If he was the one that did it, he was the 33rd person to die from that fire. He insisted that he forgave Nunez, which seems to be the feelings of many, but not all. The man had suffered, and he probably really didn't mean to cause a massacre. Remember, the Walgreens clerk insisted he had asked for the smallest bottle. Regina Adams said on the same documentary, quote, I don't think he really knew the consequences, how many people he would hurt or how many lives he would touch. Author Johnny Townsend was also interviewed for the documentary and pointed out that the gay community might have healed quicker if they had felt that there was some attempt to solve the case. Now, the public knows about the dogged arson investigators, but it wasn't widely known back then. People were hurt and angry, rightfully so, for a very long time. The case was finally closed in 1980. The report basically said the only suspect had committed suicide and, quote, the investigators were completely satisfied that he was the person who set the fire. 
and the civil lawsuits filed were tricky. Who was liable? The building owner, Phyllis Steve? The city? The fire marshal? The combined lawsuits from survivors and victims' families reached $28 million. Two and a half years after the fire, a civil district judge ruled plaintiffs had no legal cause of action against the city. Bill Steve eventually went bankrupt fighting lawsuits, and in the end, after almost four years of legal wrangling, most of the suits were dropped. The only one responsible legally was the man who started the fire. No negligence on any other person or agency could be proven. Phil Steve died in 2007. Buddy Rasmussen refuses to be interviewed or speak publicly about the fire to this day. He moved to Arkansas with his lover and told Time Magazine on the 40th anniversary, quote, When history is written, they should leave that chapter out. Clayton Delery Edwards takes on the legacy of the upstairs lounge fire in his book because, as he said, it's a matter of fierce debate whether or not upstairs kicked off gay rights activism in New Orleans. Historians point to the visit and resulting protest of Anita Bryant in 1977. She was a devoutly Christian performer who was outspoken against homosexuals in classrooms and was even known to say, quote, because homosexuals couldn't reproduce, they're forced to recruit. She had a few hit records in the 50s and 60s, but by the late 70s, she was washed up and turned to political activism. She and her husband lobbied against an ordinance that was passed in her hometown area of Dade County, Florida, that prohibited employment discrimination based on sexual orientation. She was successful in June of 1977 and was emboldened to pursue her anti-gay agenda. Bryant had actually already been booked to perform in New Orleans before she jumped into the national spotlight as a homophobic bigot. She was to sing at a pop concert series at the New Orleans Municipal Auditorium on Friday, June 17th and the next day. Her supporters held a rally in front of the auditorium in support before her performance, and the NOPD had promised her protection. However, the protest from the gay community was well organized by two groups, the Gertrude Stein Society and Human Equal Rights for Everyone. They held their own rally, and then more than 200, pro and then more than 200 protesters stood outside the auditorium during her performance with signs and t-shirts. It was a peaceful protest, but the photos are powerful. There were a few hecklers in the audience for Bryant's performance, but it wasn't that disruptive. But by Saturday, the protesters had grown to 1,500 people, and Bryant's supporters were in a group of less than 40. The gay protesters began a march at Jackson Square that went through the French Quarter to get to the auditorium shouting, Hey, hey, ho, ho, Anita Bryant has got to go. It was still a peaceful protest, but much louder. Anita Bryant gave an interview to the Times-Picayune afterwards in which she said, I'd rather my child be dead than homosexual. There is no question that the Anita Bryant protest galvanized the gay community and friends, but as Delery Edwards points out in his book, The Upstairs Lounge Arson, the seeds were sown at upstairs. The big moment was the turnout for the big memorial service and the mourners choosing to go through the front door and face the cameras. Gay people and their straight supporters had made the first stand at the church that day. Also, just weeks after the fire, the Gay People's Coalition was founded in response to the fire and announced the opening of a gay venereal disease clinic on North Rampart. The clinic was created as a safe place for gay citizens to go for treatment of gonorrhea and syphilis without fear of being outed or seeing uncaring physicians. This predates the discovery of HIV and the AIDS epidemic. Finally, six weeks after the fire, in hopes of making amends, Mayor Moon Landro met with the GPC and appointed gay and lesbian representatives to his Human Relations Committee. In September after the fire, journalist Joan Treadway wrote a six-part series on homosexuality for the Times-Picayune. The series of articles, while at the time a bit tone-deaf, was groundbreaking. For the first time, someone was writing about the gay community as people, explaining their lives and struggles, hoping to dispel ignorance and homophobia. Both Delery Edwards's and Townsend's books and the documentary Upstairs Inferno also point to the massive drive to collect money to aid in the support of survivors and to help bury the dead. Though Reverend Troy Perry had been characterized as a fairy carpetbagger, he worked tirelessly in this effort along with the rest of the MCC ministry 
and other gay activists. The effort collected close to $18,000. Clayton Delery Edwards notes that most donations were small from individuals. $5 here, $10 there. For the first time, the gay community came together to help each other out in a time of great need. It was a precursor to the organized activism that would come with the AIDS crisis when the gay community was again galvanized into coming together. Over 26,000 people had died of AIDS before President Ronald Reagan would even publicly acknowledge the crisis. Both events, the Upstairs Fire and the Anita Bryant protest, were watershed moments for gay activism. But I think it's fair to say the fire pushed the door open, but the Bryant protests knocked it down. But it's understandable why many people feel strongly about this. In 1991, the Louisiana State Museum ran an exhibit titled The Devouring Element, commemorating New Orleans' historic fires. The museum excluded the Upstairs Lounge, which is, in fact, the deadliest fire in New Orleans' history. And after much outrage, they put out a ham-handed statement about not being able to find enough photos or articles to include. While the fire is indeed difficult to research, Clayton Delery Edwards pointed out that they had no trouble finding archival footage of fires from the 18th century. Close to 20 years later, the Upstairs Lounge fire, its 32 victims, and countless survivors were still being ignored. But public sentiment did change. On the 30th anniversary in 2003, a bronze plaque was placed on the sidewalk near the Iberville Street entrance. It lists all the names of the dead. In 2012, Mayor Mitch Landro, son of Moon Landro, introduced sweeping reforms to address civil rights violations in areas of sexual assault, domestic violence, and finally, how police officers interact with gay, lesbian, and transgendered people. On the 40th anniversary in 2013, a play called Upstairs premiered in New Orleans about the fire. The documentary The Upstairs Lounge Fire premiered, and several articles and national publications came out commemorating the fire. Author Clayton Delery Edwards and artist Skylar Fain spoke to a crowd of over 200 at the historic New Orleans Collection, a privately run museum. Afterwards, a traditional New Orleans jazz funeral procession went from the steps of the museum through the French Quarter to the door of the former Upstairs Lounge. Mayor Mitch Landreau, issued a city proclamation recognizing the tragedy, and Archbishop Gregory Amon apologized on behalf of the diocese for their inaction at the time of the fire. And every year since, there is a memorial jazz funeral procession on June 24th. The second floor in the building on Iberville and Charters, where the upstairs used to be, was never a bar again. It's now storage space. The flop houses above it sit empty. It is important to note that the Upstairs Lounge Massacre was not actually a hate crime, though it is often perceived that way. Roger Nunez made a terrible, irrational, and drunken decision that took many lives, including his own. You could argue his self-hate and internalized homophobia caused this tragedy, but it was not actually an attack on the gay community. That, to me, makes it all the more tragic. A gay man suffering and struggling with his own identity, made a horrible, rash mistake. But the 32 souls lost in the fire were not in vain. The Upstairs Lounge has found its place in history, and while it may not be New Orleans' Stonewall, it is no less important to the LGBTQ community. The Upstairs was where everyone always felt at home. The place where anyone could go and be themselves. Today, Pride is celebrated loudly in New Orleans, not just at Southern Decadence, but everywhere. You can't throw a rock without hitting a gay bar in the French Quarter. And personally, those are my favorite. Love is love. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Sources for this episode were hard to come by as the upstairs fire was very underreported and misreported in the media, and no one was ever convicted. I relied heavily on Clayton Delery Edwards' book, The Upstairs Lounge Arson, and Johnny Townsend's book, Let the Faggots Burn. Townsend's book is more a portrait of the victims and survivors, 
while Delory Edwards' book is a more comprehensive account of the fire, the investigation, and the aftermath. I also recommend watching the incredible documentary Upstairs Inferno. Both authors are interviewed, as well as several survivors and leaders of the MCC Church. Immersing myself in this tragedy was heartbreaking and eye-opening. I'm so glad I picked it for my topic this week in New Orleans, as it is truly an incredible example of the best and worst of New Orleans in 1973. The gay community came together as churches and city officials abandoned them. Speaking of New Orleans, I'm here. I'm at CrimeCon. But if you're not attending the convention and you are in town, join me for a meetup with other podcasters in the bar at the Hilton Riverside on Saturday, June 8th. More details are in my show notes. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm on most large platforms like Stitcher and most podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show, make a one-time donation, or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.